All right, thank you guys for joining the Shalise Experience. Uh, today's discussion is gonna be on human trafficking, trafficking and how it affects our communities. Uh, my guest today is human trafficking advocate, Melissa Ice. Thank you very much for joining us. And thank so you for having me. The first, the first off, is, is Ice your last name or is that like a nickname? It's my real last name. I married a, a man with the last name Ice, and I didn't believe him either, but then I met my wife and Grandma Ice, so it's real. <laughs> okay, gotcha, gotcha. So just tell me a little bit about your background. Yeah, so I founded a nonprofit um, in Fort Worth, Texas, where I live, and we serve people in poverty, and so that's um, a couple of different groups. We serve refugee kids through an after-school program. We serve people experiencing homelessness through a day shelter. And then we also are an advocacy and rehabilitation program for survivors of trafficking. And so that has been what I've been doing since 2012. Um, and I'm married and I have two little girls, a little girl named Rosie, and then another little girl named Justice who came to our family through adoption. And so between running that <laughs> and having two little people it definitely keeps me busy. And then most recently, um, my team and I opened up a retail store where we employ survivors of trafficking to make hand make candles and jewelry. And so we are selling those products in our store and online um, because we want to provide the women that we serve with employment too. So got a few irons in the fire, but those are kind of the Definitely. things that I do right now. But I, but I like the fact that like the help doesn't stop. It goes, you know, because everybody has to get acclimated back to society, period. Because exactly. being trafficked is almost probably almost you can make it similar to being in prison you have to get acclimated back to society because you've been almost incarcerated or in captivity for this amount of time now what made you want to um open up that part as far as um helping with uh, human trafficking you know it, it happened pretty organically it, it was something that i had when i heard the word trafficking i think um I had only had in my mind an image of one of two things, um, either a young girl who was kidnapped in a mall parking lot with, you know, the creepy guy in the trench coat, and that was someone who got trafficked, or I think I thought of it as a little girl standing outside of brothel in a third world country, like India, the Philippines, or Cambodia, and I thought of that as trafficking. Um, I think what I didn't think of was women and young girls who were on the streets and in these really vulnerable positions who are um, being bought and sold as a means of survival or because it's something that that's all they've known because of maybe childhood sexual abuse and they ran away from home but into the arms of a trafficker and so as i was encountering that by working with people on the street um you know i would meet a girl and she would introduce me to her boyfriend and you know in my naive mind i thought oh my gosh like even this couple who's semi-homeless staying in motels kind of you know in between areas and like even people who are on the streets find love and have relationships and that was kind of my naive perspective only to build some rapport with that young woman and for her to later tell me hey so and so who you met they're actually selling me um at the motel that we live at for drugs for money for whatever and so that kind of opened up my eyes to what trafficking looks like um, in America, and then more specifically in the city that I live in, and then how it's the result of vulnerability and poverty. And it wasn't either Julia Roberts, the kind of glamorized, empowered, Vegas version, um, but it also wasn't just a young girl being kidnapped. It's a w young woman who's in a relationship with someone, and she doesn't have a way out. Yeah, that's another thing we have to definitely watch out for as far as our girls, because it's easy for them to meet guys and it, they think it's normal because they, everybody wants that little, you know, fantasy, that boyfriend to kind of sweep them off their feet. And it turns into a whole different story by the end though. Now, yes. as far as being an advocate, what does that entail? Um, are you having to like, just, just basically take me like through the process when you find out someone is being trafficked or something like that, or, you know, when they're, if they have to go, just, just say if they have, have to go to court or something like that, like how do you maneuver through that basically? Yeah, so um, I would say, you know, that was what it looked like in the beginning when I was kind of encountering girls on the streets and then fast forward um, for my organization, The Net, what it looks like today is 
um, either people call us for referrals. And so we partner with a lot of other nonprofits in town, like um, Salvation Army, for example, or Domestic Violence Shelter. Um, and they may call us and say, hey, there's a young woman in our program, or there's a, a woman in our program, and we think she has this history of exploitation and prostitution. Um, and so then that kind of puts her um, down a domino effect of things that we offer her. Um, that's one way, it's just through referrals. But the main way that we meet the women that we serve is through our local jail. And so we've been going to that jail since 2012. Um, and we do everything from visits. So we actually train advocates. So regular women, moms like me, who want to get involved, we train them to go into the jails, um, sorry, go to the jail to do like a normal outside visit. And we specifically visit every single woman in our jail that either has a prostitution charge or has a history of prostitution in her background, regardless of her charge. We also teach a class inside the jail um, and we have a relationship with um, the officers and a certain pod where we ask for women to get into the pod where we teach classes because we know that their background would lend itself to having a background in trafficking or prostitution. Um, and then we also do assessments. So anytime a woman is brought into our local jail because of our relationship with the jail, they let us know if they think she has a history of prostitution, we immediately do an assessment on her. We get her background and her history. And if she does, then we sort of pitch her for a specialty court program that we partner with and we sit on the treatment team for um, because we, the women who are in that part of the program who get accepted into it, um, their lawyers have to agree to it, their judge has to agree to move their case um, and they have to sort of present signs of wanting to change um, because quite honestly, the younger the girls are, the less tired they are. And so, and they still, you know, maybe are wrapped up in that relationship and they're just waiting to get bonded out so they can get back with him and get back to what they were doing before. Um, but then we have women who this is their, you know, they're about to go to prison. They're facing uh -huh. prison or a program. And so they're really motivated. So they get into this program. And then that program that we do is three to five years, depending on each woman. And she gets everything from substance treatment to parenting classes. If she wants to be reunited with her children, if they're estranged, um, she does trauma counseling and then for the net we give her a one-on-one -on -one advocate which is like a mentor for her we do social and recreational events for the women because a lot of them haven't their weekends haven't been spent doing normal healthy things so we have pool parties and we do chili cook-offs and we go bowling and we just try to reintroduce them to healthy social interaction um, and then when they graduate from that program a handful of them we either help them get employment through the program or um, some of them actually come to work for us, for our company that we just started only in 2018. So it's still pretty new, but it's called The Worthy Company. And so they can come work for us and um, be in production or shipping and fulfillment. We do, we're gonna train them in retail management and some of those things to help them go on to get jobs. So that's kind of the track that, um, okay. that a woman would come on if we engage with her. Now, as far as like the training that's required for you know, to go into the jail and speak with these women, like how long is that process and what does that process entail? Is there a certification or? Yeah, so um, with our jail advocates, because we're doing, the advocates that we work with, we're doing outside visits. Um, it's not a super extensive training on the jail side, um, but it is a training on our side. So something that the NET does is twice a year, we host what we call our annual human trafficking training. Um, and we cap it at about a hundred people and it always sells out in advance. I say sells out, it's maybe, I think it's $20 just to cover the cost you know, of the training. Mm -hmm. um, and then that is kind of a half day to all day training, depending on what you do. And then after you complete that, we just do an application and interview. And then we do a couple of online courses that you take. And really it's just because we want to make sure that whoever is sitting in cross from one of the women that we um, have access to, we want to make sure that every single person is on the same page. We're all trauma informed. You know, we're not sensationalizing anything when we yeah. go in there. We're literally there just to remind her of her value, her work, encourage her and help her take steps towards her goals that she wants when she gets out. Okay. And are they, are these women background checked also or the, the advocates background oh, yes. checked? Okay. Yes, part of the application and interview is us kind of <laughs> reading <Okay>. people out, <laughs> trying to understand why are you wanting to do this? Because not everyone wants to go to the jail. 
Yeah, I know. <laughs> been, been, been there to visit before and not, not fun at all. Not fun at all. Yeah. But it, it's, it's quite different, but it, it just, it does take a different type of mindset. So you definitely want to make sure that they're ready for it. Now, as far as the, as advocating, um, in general, um, because like I said, you have your, you said you have to, uh, get it approved by their attorneys and their judges and things like that. So, do you find it harder to advocate for women of color sometimes? And if so, like, why is that? Because in, in my head, I think of like Centoya Brown and then now Crystal Kaiser. So how, how does that, you know, because I, I, I believe at, at some point at, having an advocate would, it, it helps in entirety because sometimes, especially with the age, I'm thinking of like Crystal Kaiser, like her age, I'm thinking she's, not equipped to, you know, not, I'm not saying not mentally equipped to stand trial or anything like that, but she's basically, she's young. She's basically mm -hmm. still a kid and she hasn't lived as a kid, you know, and I don't think that was just necessarily a premeditated type of thing. It's one of those self-defense type of things, but if you don't have a good attorney or you don't have someone to advocate for you, it's, you know, so, and, and, and my, you know, question is like, again, you know, is it harder to advocate for women of color and like, how does that process happen? Yes, I would say, um, I would say it is. I would say it, it is, it does feel different as an ally. You can sense those differences when you are in a criminal justice setting. You know, something I always say at our human trafficking training is things like trafficking don't exist outside of things um, like power, privilege, racism, misogyny, all of those things are contributing factors that make something like trafficking actually be perpetuated yeah. and flourish in our communities. And so it's not any different. Um, that's the way that these kind of things are able to happen and continue to happen. And yeah, I think it's, it, it is interesting because we, because we work with women who a lot of them, um, it's a felony court. And so a lot of them are have felony, whether it's prostitution charges, possession charges, you know, um, theft, robbery, you know, you name it. When you start to sit down with them and learn more about their story and the things that happened to them, um, you know, their story starts to make sense. Like one of the women that we worked with um, named Crystal, she was someone that we advocated so hard for because she was in jail for eight months and we visited her all the time. Um, but as a little girl, her mom would leave for days on end. And so she would go to her neighbor's houses um, and steal food for her little brothers and sisters. And then when her mom would come back, her mom would, you know, sell her to a drug dealer down the street and at the age of 10 and 11. And so when your trafficker is your mom and you're, you're um, stealing to provide for your siblings, um, that sets up the trajectory of your life. And so fast forward, she's in our program and I'm in a courtroom with a white judge and a white bailiff. And I'm with this woman who has this, you know, extensive rap sheet, but I know her story. I know exactly the things that happened to her that brought her to the place she is today. And I'm telling the judge, I've been meeting with this woman for eight months. She doesn't need 25 years in prison. She needs people like me and organizations like mine and other people in our community to wrap their arms around her because we forgot about her. We let her fall through the cracks when she was 10 and we can't continue to do that and institutionalize her um, only to be told, you know, she's not able to be rehabilitated. Um, and at the same time, I could do the exact same thing for a white woman and almost feel and I don't, I can't describe it. I think it's only something, you know, if you're, you know, in that situation, but feel a sense of hope. Like, I think she actually may have a chance. And then at the same time, advocating for someone like Crystal, begging God, as I'm standing in a courtroom, thinking she doesn't stand a chance outside of you, please intervene because you just kind of know. And so it is weird because it is, sort of these micro things that you can just feel that have systemically seeped into these scenarios that you're in and it's hard to pinpoint out. Um, but it is, there's a sense of hopelessness sometimes when I'm advocating for women of color feeling like, I don't know if they're going to see her the way that I do. Yeah. And that's another thing um, that we'll get to that after this break really quick. 